Hello friends, this is artist Susan Jenkins here again in my studio, Monet Cafe, to bring you another little art tutorial. I've got my studio all clean now. I shared a little video yesterday. I'm just so excited and um, it's time to create something. And I thought I'd share with you um, the point of today's video or the main lesson is going to be how to do an underpainting that is a complementary underpainting with complementary colors using alcohol and um, I thought I'd go ahead you know my lessons always have a, a goal but there ends up being all these other little tidbits of things I share with you at the same time so I thought I'd just go through my process of even how I pick out my reference photo and um, get inspiration and choose my color palette so we're just going to walk through this whole process together now I happen to um, have sometimes friends and family members that take some really great photographs and there are some that I know won't mind if I use them if it's someone that I'm questionable about um, I will approach them about it but I happen to know this person won't mind she's a dear friend and I've actually done some commission work for her and her husband so hi Martha <laughs> this is her picture that she took in um, Wyoming they're on a trip and it is just gorgeous but um the challenge with this right now it's a beautiful photograph but as far as um, painting it um, I already see that the horizon line is a little close to the center so I'd like to implement the rule of thirds to this and I have a couple of options here. One is I can move it and keep it a horizontal. I've got to do something about that glare. And, um, and that's really lovely too. Do you see how the horizon line is more up in the upper third rather than right here in the middle like it was before? And that's really beautiful. So, you know, I have a decision to make on that because another crop that I played around with and tried was, cancel it, was this one. And this is a vertical, um, portrait layout it's called when it's up and down it's called portrait when it's sideways it's called landscape and um, of course we see the horizon line is in the upper third and now these flowers are the focus I like this one too because the height of these flowers you know draws attention but you know so that's just um, a couple of uh, decisions that I have to make and um, but both of those would probably work out well for a good composition. So I thought I'd show you real quick too, a neat thing that you can do. If you want to work in standard sizes like I do, um, I use a neat little app, mm, if I can find it. Okay, here it is, it's called Photo Editor. I turned off some lights to get rid of that glare so you can see better. And, hi, you can see me. And what I'm going to do here is kind of show you how I can convert my image. Now I did go ahead and crop the image to be a vertical. Um, so I cropped it in the way that I thought I would like it. Okay. And so here's my crop. I really, once I crop it the way I like it, I'm not sure what those dimensions are. Um, so that's where this little app comes in handy. And there's tons of things, apps that have photo editing abilities. So what I do here is I go to crop and it gives me all these standard sizes. I like to work in standard sizes because it's easier to find frames that you can, um, you don't have to get them custom framed, which is more expensive. So a lot of times I'll just go ahead and make it a five by seven, an eight by 10, um, or an 11 by 14. They actually don't even have the 11 by 14 option on here. Um, but this makes it um, easy to go ahead and convert it. So I look at my image here and I'm like, okay, what if I want to do a four by six? Okay, that's the dimensions for four by six. And here's the dimensions for five by seven, not quite as tall. An eight by 10 is even dumpier, but they all look pretty good. We still have that horizon line in a third or less than a third quadrant. And here's a nine by 16. Now that, to my knowledge, is not a standard size that I know of. I haven't been able to find a frame in that size. <laughs> so I'm not gonna use that one. But I'm thinking, I, because I just want this to be um, a, a lesson um, mostly about doing a complimentary underpainting. I'm just gonna pick one that's easy. So how about, and small, uh, how about a five by seven? So when I do that and I click apply, all of a sudden, and I say done, I have my five by seven uh, format for that picture. If I go back to my photos, it will be there. So that's just a really easy way to get your standard sizes um, ready. And um, it, it makes it easy to work on. Now, next step I wanna talk about is, all right, I've picked a photo. I wanna make a quick point about that too. Have you ever searched for a photo for so long that you almost lost your inspiration to paint because you're looking for the perfect photo or you get so into looking at the photos that you forget about painting. <laughs> I'm sharing that because I have done that. And um, 
So from personal experience, it's best just to sometimes, or if you have a time where you just wanna go through photos, go ahead and save a whole bunch of them, ones you like. Make that a time, you know, take an hour and pick out a lot of photos you like. So when you're in the mood to paint, you can go back to that little saved file of photos you've already pre-chosen. Then you can start to paint quickly rather than losing your creative inspiration. So that's just my advice on picking out photos. And again, be careful where you get reference photos from, make sure it's someone you know, make sure it's something either like um, paint my photo that I've shared before or your own photography. So that's just some little tips where that goes. Now, once you've chosen your photo, okay, now that I have a lot of people who ask, how do you get inspired for your color palette? What do you do? Um, I mean, so many times, if you notice in my paintings, uh, I, I punch up color quite a bit. I like color, um, but I will veer away from what's in the scene slightly. And um, I, I usually use the scene as a source of value instead of a source of color. And again, there's another neat little trick you can do um, with that is to just convert your photo um, to black and white. And um, that is a bit, uh, able, you're able to do that with um, just an iPhone or whatever. This one gives you a couple of different black and whites to choose from. Um, so I just want a basic black and white. And that way I can focus on the value rather than the color. So I often will convert it to black and white. Then the next thing I do is I look at other people's artwork that I love. Um, I find artists that I love current artists that are alive. <laughs> um, some of you know some of my favorites. Um, I love Elizabeth Mowry. I love Marla Baguetta's work and Karen Margulis and Rita Kirkman. And there's just too many to mention. You guys have mentioned some that I'm like, oh yeah, I love that artist's work too. But I'll also look at some books that I have. I like the real world. As much as I do a lot online, I like sometimes real books. And so I have this wonderful book on Monet. And of course, you know, my name of my channel is Monet Cafe because I like that loose impressionistic style. Um, I think sometimes my color is even a little bit more enhanced than some of Monet's stuff, but I love the impressionistic style. So I'll just flip through some of that and, and then I'll maybe get some other books. Look at that gorgeous color in this painting. Now this is, I, bl I believe, an oil, oil on linen. This is artist um, Kathleen Dunphy, Before the Sun it's called. And this will just inspire me. I love the use of color in this. It's actually, you can't see it as good. Now look at that. It's just gorgeous. And, um, and her use of values is amazing. So I will often flip through books and, and look at, um, this is a great book by the way, and look at how color and value has been used by other artists to give me inspiration. And then I'll go back and I'll look at my, uh, my uh, black and white photograph and I'll use both those, looking at the black and white and what inspires me to go ahead and choose a color palette. And I'll also use sometimes, I look at the mood of this painting and it looks like a bright sunny day. So I'm not gonna veer too far away from that and make it a night scene or anything like that, but um, it's going to allow me to choose the color palette based on um, kind of what's already there in the photo and uh, what I read as far as time of day and the season too as well. All right, so then the next thing I do, I'm gonna put my phone down so I can actually draw now, is I typically, not always, um, and sometimes for a painting this small I won't do this, but I typically will do a little, I believe it's called a noten, N-O-T-A-N, where you just do a quick little value sketch of your um, composition to get an idea of uh, how you're going to approach the painting. And often you can work out any issues right then before you commit it to painting it. So now I'm gonna work on the little quick value sketch. All right, so I have my little sketch pad here and I've got it already in a five by seven format. And these don't have to be perfect, but again, it's for working out any issues with your composition. So get it pretty close at least. Now what I have is I just have a little hard pastel right here. Uh, you can do this with a pencil if you like, but I just find it it's faster for me. All I'm doing is a value study and getting my composition, and I can use the uh, wider part of this to get broad shapes in, so it's just a little bit um, faster. Um, so basically what I start doing is I just kind of start looking at my composition and just qu quickly sketching in what I see and um, going from there. So I'll just work a little bit and then I'll talk about what I've done.
Um, anyway, I actually have um, probably even too much of a sketch here. You don't need that much because this is all just about doing an underpainting. And I'm going to be doing it, like I said, in complementary colors. And what does that mean, complementary colors? Well, if you notice on the color wheel, um, it's laid out in such a way that if you look right across from a particular color, you're going to see its complement. And if you have a scene that has a lot of trees in it that are like green, uh, even blue greens and blues, you notice what's directly across from that. It's reds and violets and oranges and yellows. Um, the complement to purple is going to be yellow. So that's why when you have a lot of scenes that have um, landscapes or nature, you're going to get a lot of your complementary colors that are in, in this range right here. So that's why I have picked out some complementary colors to do the underpainting. So I thought I'd go ahead and show you. Um, here's my little color palette I picked for my scene. And notice the scene is um, a kind of, like I said, a summery scene. Don't need that. And, but I don't want to do it totally summery. I wish all my things would quit popping up. I want to give it a little bit of a in between spring and summer. I see in there, um, in my mind, just like some springtime colors and flowers and things in there as well. Now I've got my little sketch up here that I did, just a quick little value sketch and an idea of a composition so I can keep referring back to that. But, um, but that spring summer feel is how I picked out this color palette with my warmer greens. I've got some warmer, I've got some cooler greens, and I've got, um, of course, some blues for the water and just for the distant trees and mountains and things. And these are going to be my complementary colors. Of course, I need a good dark dark for some of those darker trees and darker foliage in there. But uh, other than that, we're just going to use some of those complementary colors to block in um, quickly uh, just an underpainting that is complementary, and then we will do a wash with alcohol. So let me get started with that. Now you can see my palette and my complementary colors. I'm going to do the underpainting. All right, time to go. Get started. Okay, so now that the complementary underpainting is laid in with pastels, I'm basically, I'm showing this because I've had a few people ask what type of alcohol I use. It's just regular alcohol that you get at any Walgreens or wherever, and um, it works just fine. The difference between the alcohol and water is that alcohol just dries faster. So what I do, this is a small painting, so I don't need a whole lot of this. I wanna give enough so that um, I don't have to stop and reapply. So usually, you know, that's enough. And this is going to dry up, um, so don't overdo it because once you've contaminated it with your colors and stuff like that, you don't want to pour it back in the bottle and it will dry up before the next time you use it. <laughs> so be conservative, but don't overdo it at the same time. All right, so now after I have my alcohol like this, I got a couple of brushes. I like working with these flat brushes because this is not about detail. This is about shapes really just shapes and value is all we're working on at the beginning stages, okay? So I use the, a biggest, the biggest brush possible until I find a spot I can't use it anymore. So I'm gonna start with this big one. And I work top to bottom because, I'm gonna sit this down and move this so that I don't um, uh, get my colors all blended too much. I work uh, top to bottom and in sections and it really helps. And I also keep a paper towel handy because I wipe off a lot. Like if I get a lot of dark on my brush, um, I don't want that dark to get into the yellow. So I'll, I'll wipe the brush off pretty good before I go to that area. So you'll kind of see how I work here. So again, this is more just about laying it in. And um, I like the drips. Some people may not. That's why I keep my, um, my uh, paper up. See how I'm wiping off so that I don't get um, that Lavender is not blending like it normally does. <laughs> um, so I'm just getting it in there. And this will dry lighter than you see. It looks dark here, but it will dry a lot lighter. So messy is okay at this stage. 
It's just about getting that color underneath it. Nothing has to be perfect. It's just general. If you get a runaway drip, you can kind of blot it off. So I'm, I'm now I've got my brush kind of working sideways and I'm just kind of giving an idea of where these trees are. Got a little bit of my dark purple up there in that area, but that's okay. Because these trees are like the darkest thing in the scene other than the foreground grasses. I think I might need that smaller brush now. I'm getting kind of a lot of alcohol on there. So this now is going to get those reflections. And this is more of a, the trees in the background kind of have more of a, a warm red going. I'm sorry, a cool red than a warm red, but that's okay. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my big brush for this bigger area of the water. Again, I'm rinsing off pretty good, and see how that before was coming off so much of that color? Now it's a little bit cleaner. And you can change your angle of your brush if you like. And pastel is going to cover this. I have people ask sometimes, why do you do an underpainting if you cover up the whole thing? <laughs> well, it looks like you cover up the whole thing, and some people, maybe they actually do. But for the most part, you're giving yourself a base, and a lot of times those colors do peek through. And so that just really makes it more interesting. All right, and i uh, got me a little area that's going to be that little path right there. And now I'm going to work kind of up from here. I'm laying down some dirt, as Karen Margolis says, getting the dark values in that front area. And notice I did not put in those um, white flowers because I'm just going to add those on top of all this. All right, so that's pretty much all you do right there. I've got just complementary colors underneath um, my painting. And that's all you need. And kind of um, more impressionistic at this stage is better than detail. You don't want a lot of detail. Big shapes. Keep thinking. Big shapes. All right. And there you have it. That's pretty much it. Doesn't <laughs> look very great, but at this stage, it's not supposed to. All right. So now we let this dry. You can get a blow dryer if you want, or you can just wait a few minutes because it is going to dry rather quickly, or you can just fan it. But um, notice already how this is drying back here lighter, and um, then we're ready to get started. So all right, so now it's pretty much dry, and I typically work from the sky down, um, and I think that's because I like to establish my lightest values and um, getting in, again, your, your values so that things stay consistent and you don't get stuck on any one area. I love to get the light sky in first. Okay, and I think I'm actually going to do the sky a little bit of a purpley pink sky, and um, let me see here, yeah. And I know I did not do like a complementary color on the sky here. But sometimes a lavender is nice in the sky, and um, I might even add a little bit of this blue. I've got a, that's too dark. Where's that blue that I had? Aha, here it is. Yeah, like that. So it's a combination of a, a lavender and a blue in the sky here. And I'm going to have my light source here um, for a couple of reasons. I think, uh, I actually always love to have the light source in the far distant area that you can see. Sometimes I'll put it behind the trees, but in this case, I'm, I want to put it here because I think it's going to balance things out more. Notice the painting's a little heavy on this side already with the trees here and the flowers here. And, you know, I am going to put a few more flowers here in this further grouping, but um, if I put the light over here too, the whole thing's going to be balanced too much on this side. At least that's my opinion.
All right, I'd like to uh, mention a couple of things here. Actually, I wanted to give a lot more commentary during the process, but you know, life gets in the way sometimes. I had dogs barking, people coming to the door, uh, my son asking me a question, and so I just decided to paint. <laughs> but anyway, um, some of the things I wanted to mention was obviously in reflections, we do the mirror image, um, like I'm doing here with these trees and with these trees and keeping it soft. But at the very end, I'm gonna be able to just take a, uh, one of the values that will work going into this area that's similar to the value of the color of the water here and brush over it a bit. But you want to finish these reflections before you do that because you can't really go back and do it afterwards. So anyway, so I'm just trying to get um, the general idea of a believable reflection. And the reason I'm doing this a little bit more detailed right now before I move on to here is one, you know, we want to have this done before I do the water. And two, I'm, I'm working in layers here because I know that this flower is going to be up in this reflection area and in the water. So I want to get some of this taken care of before I lay that flower down. I also want to make sure I have enough tooth in the paper to lay it down. I think I will. I should. If not, I'll spray some workable fixative and we'll be, we'll be good to go. So anyway, you can see how those dark, dark trees um, really got covered up mostly by some warmer greens. Again, these are cooler in the background. They're further away. These are warmer, and these can be brighter, darker, and warmer still in the foreground. So, you know, while sometimes you may feel like, man, that's too dark, just keep in mind that you are going to be laying down um, some value um, or some warmer values on top of that and some lighter values. And so now I wanted to point out that back in here, I know it's far away, we can't see a lot of detail which is why these trees are more subdued. However, sometimes it's nice to throw in a trunk or two. In the darker areas, if, you, if I'm looking at my reference photo right now, I see there are some various little trunks showing. And again, like everything, we don't want them consi consistent, like trunk, 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 then it's just gonna look not believable. Nature doesn't work that way. So um, it's probably, uh, I'm gonna check the value a little bit here. This might be too light, let's see here, but maybe not. I'm looking at where some of these are. They're kind of, this is like a grouping of a bunch of bushes kind of in the front of the trees. And um, back in here, there's a couple little spots in here. I'm using just the side of this. Yeah, see how I got a little bit of that there? Um, it's so, so subtle. And um, maybe I can get it a little bit better here. Let's see here. That's okay. Again, we're just doing some here, there, and everywhere. We don't want them, you don't want too many, and you don't want it too consistent. And sometimes the trunks are dark, um, so you want to uh, keep in mind, usually if the foliage is light, the trunk is dark. If the foliage is dark, the trunk is light. So now the hard part is trying to recreate these little marks down in the reflection. Because I'm telling you, I am working from a teeny little blade of this pastel and it's just just in general you know it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect but you just want it believable that one's a little long but I can brush that out okay so again we're just emulating or giving a suggestion of where those trunks are okay so I'm gonna lighten them up a tad and they're gonna lighten up when I do that brush of water across there as well all right, so we're getting that kind of going there. And I think before getting too fussy, I'm just gonna go ahead and give that, um, that water reflection going across there. And um, then I'll get going on the other flowers. Notice I am I'm wiping this off each time. This is a little bit of a harder pastel. You see how it got dirty right there? I'm using my paper that I have on my table here and cleaning it off um, so that I get a clean stroke of this each time I go across, because otherwise you're just going to be muddying it up. All right, you see how that just gave a little indication? And you can occasionally do a couple of little darker um, strokes in there, but um, you want to be careful not to do that too much or it gets just kitsch kitsch means tacky. <laughs> All right, so we got a little idea of the water going across there. I think I do need to um, clean this up a bit over here. Some of my reflections 
don't look right. It's a little darker over here towards the edges. Maybe it can go all the way off there. Right, that looks better. See, this is what I deal with, <laughs> diesel. Yep, my little art helpers. <laughs>